fill us up so that we could steward well the blessings that you've given us. We thank you, Lord, for family. We thank you for friends. We thank you for health and for wealth and for just the rich, rich blessings that you've put upon us. We know that you are the source of all those things. And so it's only appropriate and deserving for us to bow the knee of our hearts and to say, be the center of my life. And if you're in agreement with me on that, you may say amen. 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 Happy New Year again. So I've been praying and pondering how to begin a new year. Typically, I do something that's kind of fun and practical, relationship-oriented, stuff to help with everyday stuff of life. And, uh, uh, you know, just have a good little kickstart in the beginning of the year. But I always ask the Lord, what's on your heart and what do you want to do? And I felt... Actually, to be honest with you, where, where the main uh, you know, motivation of this new series came from was uh, so many of you that sent me notes and messages and emails about the last message uh, uh, in, uh, in December uh, referring to those, those whispers of God and how uh, we have a God who clearly wants to communicate and I could tell that there was some curiosity and some interest and in how can we experience more of those whispers from heaven? How can we experience more of his life, uh, the living God, active and at work, not just in worship service? I mean, boy, when you got young people leading us in worship like we had today, which, well done, team. Woo! Man, man. Listen, if you have a hard time coming into God's presence with this kind of worship experience, man, check your pulse, you know. Make sure you're still alive and breathing, you know. But what was really on my heart in this new series was uh, to do something uh, talking about living in God's presence. Um, I've been in church for years. Many of you have. And so, you know, we're no stranger to the idea that, you know, God makes his presence known. If you've been in church in any amount of time, you, you understand that, which is a good thing because life is tough. Life is perplexing. Most of us are never more than, a, you know, a half a step away from some difficult challenge, you know, whether it's, you know, care and concern for our adult children that are maybe making poor choices or, you know, some health issues going on or financially things have been tough. Uh, you know, you've got that family member who we've been estranged from for some time and there's just a disconnect there and you don't know what to do about it and yet it's heartbreaking. We all know those situations that typically, I'll be honest, oftentimes when those situations knock on the tuggle door, I'm telling you, my joy has a tendency to go right out the window. Now, I know it shouldn't be that way, but that's kind of how it goes for me oftentimes. I've accepted the fact that life is hard, but I stand by the notion that preserving joy, we actually have some choice about that. I don't think that's an automatic that our joy has to fly out the window because life becomes difficult. And I think the key to keeping our joy is best stated by the psalmist in Psalm 16. He wrote, you make known to me the path of life in your presence. There is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What a great promise. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In your presence is the fullness of joy. Now listen, all of us know that experience when we've been carrying a burden, when we've been going through some kind of hard and difficult situation, and then a friend calls us or we reach out to a friend and we get together, we have that cup of coffee and we get that listening ear, and we're uplifted, we're encouraged. We, we've all had that experience, right? Right? But we've also had the experience before where we also know that our our good friends are busy people and they've got things going on. And not only that, but we've even had the experience where where the best of friends who, who have the best of intention, because of the complexity of what we're going through, or at least the complexity of what I go through, sometimes I don't even know how to formulate a good question much less a good answer. Sometimes the difficulties of life are so perplexing to me, all I know is I'm ultra-confused, baffled, and eh, you know, almost overwhelmed. And so 
if I can't even communicate to my friends what's going on, it's not likely that they're going to deeply understand what I'm going through because I don't even know what I'm deeply going through, you know? I'm, I'm just <laughs> There's limitations to these friendships. But I'm so delighted that we have a friend in the Holy Spirit who has no limits, who when we don't even understand what's going on inside of us, he does understand. The Apostle Paul spoke to this when he wrote, in the same way, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, helps us in our weakness. Aren't you grateful for that? We don't know what we're to do or to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. That's the Holy Spirit who prays that way with groans that words cannot express. I've been fiddling with that, and I've actually been getting some mileage out of it. When my words fail me, I just do some groaning. It actually works pretty good. (laughs) And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. So we have this friend in the Holy Spirit who understands what we're going through even if we don't. He knows what's on Jesus' heart and he's linking up what's on Jesus' heart with what we need at any given time and point. And so while friends are great, they are limited. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit helping us in our weakness, when we talk about the presence of God... We should understand that he, the Holy Spirit, and his presence is really the source where all that we need comes from. Everything we need comes from the presence of God who is the Holy Spirit. These blessings, they flow to the Christ follower. And much like Deborah gave words of knowledge this morning of, hey, sometimes the Holy Spirit shows up and says, look, I want to do a good work in some marriages, and I want to do a good work in some working relationships, and I want to do a good work in some bodies and some health issues. From time to time, the Holy Spirit shows up in a very specific way. That's his presence. That's his power at work in the church. And so, I want us to be better than average, Living Hope, at understanding the presence of God because, again, all of the blessings of heaven flow from his presence, flow from the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, when we talk about the presence of God, theologians view this in three perspectives. I think it's important for us to understand this because if we don't understand this, we will become confused. I promise you, you would be confused without this basic understanding, these three views, three perspectives, but we, when we talk about the presence of God. And so number one, we have the omnipresence of God. Omnipresence, fancy theological word that basically says God is everywhere, which is not to be confused with pantheism. Pantheism, Pantheists believe that God is actually everything and God is in everything and every material object on the planet is a God and therefore God is everywhere. Christian theology doesn't teach us that. The Lord God is one God. He is one, but he is omnipresent. And the psalmist described his omnipresence in Psalm 139 when he wrote, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. Listen, that's a wonderful attribute of the Lord God because it's wonderful for us because, hey, wherever we go, he's only a prayer away. Wherever we go, his countenance, his face is forever turned towards his followers. All we have to do is turn our countenance towards him, and there's a connect. That's very good news. The second presence of God understanding, their point of view, is the indwelling presence of God. That means that once we are born again, once we have recognized our sinfulness and that our only way for eternal life and to know the abundant life that God promises is to confess our sin and to seek his forgiveness and to recognize Christ's work on the cross as propitiation for our sin and for our wrong, and we embrace that and we receive that and we make the decision. 
Like I said earlier, boy, if this is all true, I will give my life to this. And that's what we do. We give our life to this. Everything is run through the filter of what would please Jesus, how I steward my time, my energy, my money, everything. What would please Jesus? Once we become born again, the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us. There's a slew of scriptures I might use to support this idea, but one of my favorites is 1 Corinthians 3.16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? This is an indwelling reserved for those who have put their faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of sin and for eternal salvation. And then the third view of God's presence, which is what we're going to focus on primarily in this series, is what we call the manifest presence of God. The manifest presence of God. The key factor that distinguishes the manifest presence from God, from the omnipresence of God, or even from the indwelling presence of God, the key factor that separates it is that simply this, awareness. <laughs> awareness. We can actually never lose God's presence in reality because he's omnipresent. And if we're a Christ follower, he lives within us. But there are, can certainly be times where we can lose our sense of his presence, right? Uh, never a time when God is not present with us, but there are times when God is not manifestly with us. Sometimes his presence is not clear or obvious. You know, like those times before your first cup of coffee. Um, not clear or obvious to the human eye or to the human soul, which is why Paul said that, hey, we walk by faith and not by sight. God's omnipresence can exist without our awareness, but the manifest presence of God cannot exist without our awareness. The whole point of God's manifest presence is that our awareness of him is awakened. Our awareness of him is awakened. You know, in 2016, we looked at the work and person of the Holy Spirit. We spent almost half a year, 20 weeks, in the book of Acts. Um, we learned how the church was birthed when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. The church was, was uh, uh, from that point on, the, the Holy Spirit was manifesting his presence among his people over and over and over again. We saw that in the book of Acts, which, of course, is a template of how the church in contemporary times is to function and to work and to govern and to flow in step with God's Spirit. I think most of us have had plenty of moments in a worship service, much like we had this morning, when the Holy Spirit manifested his presence. You could feel it. I pretty much always feel God's presence in a worship service. Certainly felt it this morning. How about you? You know? And I'm not a particularly good feeler. And later on in the, in the series, we're going we're gonna to talk about uh, how human beings learn to attach and how personality and temperament are actually, um, you know, pretty influential in how significant people uh, attach themselves in relationship on an emotional level. And I'm telling you, man, I'm really far down on that scale. I mean, it, it, you know, heaven and earth has to move for me to feel anything, really, you know. But when we gather together, there's apparently an exception to that where God says, hey, Barry, there's room for you, even you, in my presence. Come on in. And so I do. <laughs> and we felt that. This joy, his peace, his comforts. We felt chains falling off. We felt a shift in an attitude. How many of you are like me where you've come to church before when the attitude was a little sucky and by the time you left it was much improved? Yeah, you know, that's the manifest presence of God. Or conviction, you know, we had some sin on the back burner in our life or maybe even on the front burner in our life and honestly we didn't care too much about it and then something happens in God's manifest presence and now it gets moved to the front of the line in terms of being a deal to reckon with. Conviction takes place in his presence. Encouragement takes place in his presence. And not only that, but I've been in plenty of services where the manifest presence of God showed up and did miracles. I've witnessed 
physical healings taking place in the manifest presence of God. I've witnessed uh, people being set free from addiction, being set free from spirits that were really ugly and foul. I've watched people uh, uh, experience a reverse in circumstances. Now, that, personally, that hardly ever happens to me where, you know, Lord, I'm tired of this. Would you just make this go away? I hardly even pray that prayer anymore because the Lord never answers that one for me. But I've seen it work for others where tough circumstances got reversed. All of these are examples of God's manifest presence and, again, typically taking place in a worship service. But the focus of this series and what I'm wondering in, the question is, is it possible to experience the manifest presence of God every day? I'm under the persuasion it is. And so we're going to take a look at that. So to begin with, we talk about the very beginning when God is walking and talking with Adam and Eve. They begin such fellowship in the evening, each and every, each and every evening, having this wonderful time of uh, intimacy and no shame and vulnerability, and it's all good. And then Adam and Eve made a terrible choice. And sin entered into the human race. And we're all familiar with the story, but for the sake of this point, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8 says, after the sin took place, that they, Adam and Eve, heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord. And there it is. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Obviously, that's not talking about the omnipresence of God because God is everywhere, and there is no hiding place where you can hide from God's omnipresence. No, it's talking about the manifest presence of God. That you can hide from. I can't tell you how many times I've had people who I've run into out and in out and about in town where you know they've been kind of a wall from Living Hope for a while, and you know honestly, if you if you go a wall and we run into each other after you've been gone for several weeks, please please don't do this because really my patience has become very very thin with this, where people want to either make a whole bunch of excuses or occasionally, this is the one that I, that I hear from time to time, is it's actually not an excuse. There's a confession that, you know, man, I've just I've been blowing it, you know. I've been, been, you know, drinking too much alcohol. I've been on the Internet, you know, looking at porn again and stuff like that. And I just feel like such a hypocrite coming to Living Hope. You know, I just, I just don't want to, I, I just feel so terrible about the duality of my life. I just want to say, listen, man, if you're struggling, if you've got a besetting sin going on, you should be the first one here on Sunday morning. You should be running here because really your only hope is in the presence of God. Good luck changing that stuff on your own, which is sort of the implication. I'm going to clean up my act, and once I'm cleaned up, then I'll be back. And so, yeah, nowadays when people share that story with me, I'm just saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to call you on Sunday morning and I'm going to remind you to be here. So be, be forewarned that if you go AWOL, I'm going to call, okay? <laughs> Interesting that Adam and Eve's distancing from the manifest present of God is certainly an influence of sin. Another example of Um, the manifest presence of God. God has just asked Moses, who's been at Sinai for some time now, saying, hey, Moses, it's time for us to move on. It's time for us to go into that promised land. Now, Moses already knows that, you know, he's kind of barred from being the one to actually go in the land, and Joshua has been kind of lingering as his number one, but it hasn't been confirmed yet, and so there's this conversation that takes place of, uh, you know, hey, Who's going to lead your people going in? I know it's not going to be me. You know, let me know. You know who who's going to who's going with me as we cross over, and this is God's response to that. 
The Lord replied, my presence will go with you. Not Joshua yet, just my presence is going to go with you. I'll give you rest. And then Moses said, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know, referring to the inhabitants of the promised land, how would any of those people know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other peoples on the face of the earth? I was so tempted just to preach on that right there. That is the thing that distinguishes a Christ follower from all other peoples of the earth is that our God manifests his presence with us and he doesn't do that elsewhere. Obviously, this is, again, not talking about the omnipresence of God because the omnipresence of God is constant. It's fixed. No, the text is clear that both God and Moses are acknowledging that there is a presence that may or may not go with a person. That's the nature of the manifest presence of God. Maybe the way I could illustrate this to you between the difference between, uh, you know, um, the manifest presence versus the more fixed omnipresence. I think about, you know, one of the characteristics, one of the greatest characteristics of living hope is that y'all are so generous financially. Most of you have heeded my pastoral input that I I share this all the time about people live on a percentage of their income. If you don't choose what percentage you're going to live off of, it will be at least 100, maybe 110 or more. God's recommendation is that you live on less than 100, but choose a percentage. And most of you have actually done that. And as a result of that, uh, every year, because you give by percentage, every year, Living Hope finishes financially in the black. Especially, that's a remarkable statement, that that was true in 2008, 2009, 2010. We didn't miss a year there. We finish strong in the black every year. We're a generous church because every couple of few years we have things that we need to have done. The most recent thing was this new ceiling and our lights, getting ready for video production. And it was, you know, 30000 or more dollars that we needed there. And all of my pastor friends that when they're doing some kind of a, they call it campaign in church world, you know, raising money for something above and beyond just the normal operational costs of church life, usually campaigns go on for a minimum of a year, sometimes several years. Well, we've done several of these campaigns, and the money we need comes in not in years, but in months, in months. And that's money's above and beyond the generous percentage that all of you share. At Christmas time, the decorations that you notice have names on them. We wanted to uh, uh, put a roof on a sister church of ours in Peru. And uh, so we, as just kind of a fun little gimmick to encourage people to give. We, we said, hey, if you give $10, you will give it, we'll put you, your name on a, on a red ornament. And if you give $20, we will put your name on a gold ornament. And most of us did that on behalf of our, uh, of our grandchildren. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, uh, generously, Living Hope stepped up, and uh, you know our goal was to reach a thousand dollars. And um, what was the final count, Colleen? Um, close to double that. Uh, yeah, 16, 16. yeah, goal of a thousand came up with uh, sixteen fifty. And so, here's the deal: generosity is present every time Living Hope gathers because we are a generous people. But generosity manifests itself when we write a tithe check. Generosity manifests itself when we write a check for 
I love living hope to do some kind of repair or upgrade. Generosity manifests itself uh, when we put names on Christmas ornaments. So the presence of generosity is always here. It manifests itself at certain times. And so similarly, when we gather, the Holy Spirit manifests himself as we gather and he wants to manifest himself in your everyday life. I like to put it this way. He wants to manifest himself to do something in, through, and for you. So by definition, the manifest presence of God is an experience that we both leave and enter. And so today, I want to, this is just the first lesson of this entire series. Uh, today, I want to I focus more on the, on the leaving the manifest presence of God. Is it possible to leave? Absolutely. Not possible to leave the omnipresence of God. It's not possible for a Christ follower to leave the indwelling presence of God. But hmm, it is most certainly possible to leave the manifest presence of God. We, t- we looked a moment ago at the story of Adam and Eve. If you opened your Bible to that, turn over one page to chapter 4, and, and you're introduced to Adam and Eve's kid, Cain. Cain was a bad boy. He offered some second-rate offering to God that God uh, didn't accept. Uh, His brother Abel, on the other hand, did offer an offering that God did accept, and instead of, uh, you know, uh, Cain gets all bent over that, and and God comes and says, look, man, you know, attitude adjustment here, dude, you know, do the right thing, do the right thing, Cain, and I'll accept your your gift, I'll accept your offering. (coughs) So what does Cain do? He sets up a, a, a situation to kill his brother and does that, and then God, you know, goes looking for Cain. Obviously, sin, once again, has created this distance. Once again, has the manifest presence of God has, uh, you know, there's been a, a leaving of that manifest presence. And look at what the consequences are of Cain's actions. Chapter 4, verse 16, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. Another classic example of how people can leave the manifest presence of God is the story of Jonah. Jonah was a prophet of God. He was called on to prophesy pending judgment against the community of Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh and give the warning. And it's interesting, he... He didn't want to do that because he knew that if these people were to actually repent, that God would have mercy, that God would retract the pending judgment. And apparently, Jonah wanted Nineveh utterly destroyed, and he just didn't trust God's wrath. He didn't trust that God would follow through. Theologians and commentators have debated, you know, what was, what was Jonah's hang-up, you know? I mean, most of us would think, well, gosh, you know, if, if the bad guy turns good, isn't that a point for celebration? I'm not sure, but, you know, my research, I, I do land on the argument that I, I think it was really a deal where when you look at the history of this community of Nineveh, I mean, it was a, it was a wicked, wicked, wicked community. I mean, wicked to the point where it would make ISIS look like a troop of Boy Scouts. It was that bad. I'm guessing that Jonah had issues, probably had a family member or two that were killed by a Ninevite of some kind. So, we see the occasion where Jonah hates these guys. He's not going to go and give this word that the Lord's asking him to do. And so Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 The word of the Lord came to Jonah and the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish 
And there it is, from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. He paid the fare, went down into it to go to them, to Tarshish, to get away from the presence of the Lord. And so here we are, examples where people are fleeing the manifest presence of God, not the omnipresence of God. Um, And... From this, we get some insight into how we actually leave the manifest presence of God. How? How do we leave the manifest presence of God? (laughs) It's pretty obvious. By not doing what the Holy Spirit is asking of us. God told Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree. They did. They left the presence of God. He told Cain to deal with his attitude. He didn't. He left the presence of God. He told Jonah to go to Nineveh. He didn't. He left the presence of God. Whenever we talk about disobedience, sinfulness, though, I always feel a pastoral caution in my heart, a reminder, because we are Christ followers, that we don't cop to any religious spirit or religious attitude when God's Spirit speaks to us, Living Hope, and says, hey, y'all need to repent. It's so important to stay away from a religious spirit. Here's the one I'm talking about there. Religion, you've heard me say this many, many, many times. You know, religion is, uh, you know, really uh, trying really hard to be really good, You know, the expanded version of that is uh, trying really hard to be really good to avoid God's wrath and or receive his blessings. That's religion. Christianity, on the other hand, clearly teaches that in Christ Jesus, I am already blessed, holy, and blameless in his sight. There's an expanded version of that as well. In Christ Jesus, I'm already blessed, holy, and blameless in his sight to fulfill the purposes for which I was created. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit's manifest presence leaving because we've not been doing what he's asked us to do, we're actually distancing from him. We're the ones that are avoiding him. The examples I gave were all pictures of God in pursuit of people that were running away from him. And that is so indicative of how it goes for all of us and why the manifest presence of God may not be showing up in our everyday life is because God's wanting to take us down these paths where, hey, if you'll follow me in this direction, Barry, I'm going to teach you how to love exquisitely. I'm going to teach you how to love people who can't love you back. But we kind of prefer those roads where I I just assume stay in isolation because being around people is risky. Or, you know, the Holy Spirit is uh, wanting to take us down certain roads and and calling us to certain roads that are designed to make us bold in our witness where we're not so overly concerned and cautious about offending somebody who's far from God. He's wanting to give us some boldness, but instead we're pulling back and we're going down these roads that kind of leave us on the timid side. Or God's wanting us to step into environments where he can actually heal us physically, emotionally, relationally, is these environments, you know, small group, for example, or celebrate recovery, for example, stepping into these environments where some healing can take place. You know, our all church prayer meeting coming up this Wednesday, 6 30, all are going to be there, right? There's an environment where some healing can take place. But again, we're like, man, you know, my life is so busy, I've got so much going on, I just you know. And we don't follow him in those paths. Or the Lord's wanting to take us down paths and directions where he wants to make us even more generous. Or there's someone here who, you know, hasn't learned to give by percentage yet because 
you know, well, over here, it's like, gosh, you know, I, just, I just don't see how I can do that. I can, you know, things are tight. It would, it would never work out. And so we stick to a life that basically puts us now in the realm where, you know, we're basically a taker. And this is the road that the Holy Spirit's taking us down that would actually make us a giver. You know, essentially, the Lord's always taking us down these risky roads of faith. And we pull back like Jonah, and say, mm, 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 mm. And we choose our own path that I guess I would summarize as safety. He's wanting to take us down paths that without him would be impossible. And we choose paths that are possible indeed without him. In short, we become a Christ distancer instead of a Christ follower. This is where the disconnect takes place, Living Hope. This is where we leave one of the ways. Keep coming back. We'll talk more about ways that we can leave the manifest presence, and we're going to put even more emphasis on things we do do in order to be in the manifest presence of God. But we come to that why in the road, the Holy Spirit's veering left, and we're wanting to go right. So by way of application this morning and in closing, you probably know where I'm going with this. I want you to identify, and you may need to ask the Holy Spirit, because sometimes in my journey when the Holy Spirit's wanting to take me, especially on those roads that are impossible without him, and those roads are risky. They're risky. They scare me. And so I come over here to this path that is doable without him. Sometimes those roads, I've been on this road so long and ignored that road so long, I've forgotten what that road even was. But the Holy Spirit hasn't forgotten And if you'll ask him right now, he'll whisper to you. When you hear whispers from heaven, he's ready to whisper to you right now. What is that thing? That step of faith. That act of obedience. Because when we choose these roads, you know, God still loves us but you will not find the Holy Spirit to go, well, gee, I was thinking we would go this way because this would make you like Jesus, but, hmm, you want to go down that road that won't do anything to make you like Jesus, but hey, I like you so much. Okay, let's go. No. He doesn't roll that way. He lovingly says, back over here. And if you've forgotten, well, Holy Spirit, manifest yourself right now, would you? Would you speak to each heart and to each mind of what that, what that thing was when they came to that Y in the road and you were veering left and we veered right? Would you just speak to our hearts right now what that is? You got it? You hearing the whisper? Number two, always, always, always a good idea in the Christian theology of repentance to make known the area where you've struggled. So I call this bringing it into the light of day. Most likely, if you're stuck, it's a secret. And most things don't change as long as they remain a secret. So I want you to find a safe person who bears the image of Jesus, who's not judgmental, who's not critical, who just delights in you making yourself accountable and just say, hey, this is where I've gone off the beaten path. Bring it into the light of day. And then number three, take a first step. Take a first step. And again, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak right now to what that first step would look like. I ask the Lord 
for examples of first steps. I thought of many, but I was reluctant to share them because I felt like that was something that you just needed to hear from the manifest presence of God yourself, that he would speak to you what a first step looks like. And you'd be surprised if the area where you veered this way and you're ready to go this way in this new year of 2017, you'd be surprised how if it's no longer a secret and you've taken a first step, you'd be surprised how that ball can just keep on rolling, how you can just keep moving down that direction. I did this for years and years and years regarding exercise. You wouldn't know it by looking at me that I exercise on virtually a daily basis, but I actually do because if I don't, anxiety eats me up. And so, but for years and years and years, I'd always, first step example, I would tell myself, Barry, don't be a knucklehead. You can do anything for 60 seconds because my flesh was saying, nope, we're not going to get on that ski machine. Nope, we're not going to get on that treadmill. Nope, we're not going to put on those shoes. Nope, nope, nope. I mean, my flesh was adversarial, perhaps demonic, I'm not sure. But I told myself, you know, I can hold my breath for 60 seconds. So I would do this every morning, 60 seconds, I'm going to get on that machine and get going. And if at the end of 60 seconds I want to quit, I'll give myself permission to do that. That was my first step, just 60 seconds. I don't need to do that anymore, but for the years and years that I did do that, I can testify that never once at the 61 second mark did I quit. Never once. It's the power of a first step. So take it out of secrecy and identify a first step. But if you're really confused of what a first step might look like, please talk to me. I'm pretty good and creative about first steps. Okay? Father, we once again bow before you at the end of this service. We thank you for a new year. We thank you for a fresh start. Lord, I can't think of any better way of making 2017 a great year than to be upping the ante, to step more and more into your manifest presence, to be more and more connected to your spirit, to be more and more a Christ follower and not a Christ distancer. And so, Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you shower your people with your spirit? Would you infuse them with power and conviction and grace to walk wholeheartedly after you? Apart from your spirit, Lord, we can't do these things. But with you, all things are possible. Amen. Amen. Stand with me. We will close. Lord, bless you. Enjoy 2017. Come back next week. We're going to be talking more about the manifest presence of God. You don't want to miss next week's message.